MBA students, esteemed guests, please rise for the procession. Please be seated. Students, esteemed guests, faculty and staff, welcome to the MBA 2016-17 end of course ceremony. I present to you the Dean, Professor Peter Tufano. Good afternoon, almost graduates. Good afternoon, loved ones. Good afternoon, faculty, staff. Welcome here to the Sheldonian Theater, which is an incredibly apt location for this event. So the Sheldonian Theater was designed by Christopher Wren. Christopher Wren would go on to design St. Paul's Cathedral, as probably many of you know. Um, but this was one of his first commissions. He was 31 years old. He was a noted scientist and astronomer and he was going through a career change. He decided he wanted to do something different, and he became one of the England's most celebrated architects. So a building designed by somebody relatively young in the midst of career change seems like a pretty apt place to do this ceremony. Um, and we hope that your life's work turns out as good as Christopher Wren's. So. Now, Christopher Wren did his work about 350 years ago, but rather than think about 350 years, let's think about 355 days because it was 355 days ago, almost exactly at this time, that we gathered together, not here, but on the Nelson Mandela Auditorium. And on that day, and you probably remember, there was a sense of energy in the room, a uh, sense of expectation, hope, a little anxiety too. Um, and you may or may not remember what I said then, but I'd like to go back to that day that we were together and reflect on some of the things that we talked about then and think about them a year later. Remember, I told you I wouldn't tell you about how wonderful Oxford was. I wouldn't tell you about how hard it was. I wouldn't praise you excessively, but I'd ask you to consider the work ahead. Now, as we finish the year, it seems fitting to step back and think about those four things. So a year ago, I explicitly said that I didn't want to inflate your egos anymore, and I wasn't going to come to praise you. But today, I do. Today, it's about you. It's to celebrate you all to celebrate your diverse backgrounds coming from virtually every con well, not virtually, from every continent, from all kinds of walks of life, from all kinds of professions, um, to celebrate the women and men who are here, your individual accomplishments, your accomplishments as teams, and your collective accomplishments. For our guests, and let me apologize my backs to you, that's just the way this room is set up. I want you to know that this is one of the most accomplished and fierce MBA classes ever as witnessed by the fact that they beat everybody else in the MBAT tournaments. <laughs> Perhaps you'll hear more of that later from the students. We celebrate your ingenuity, we celebrate your creativity, manifested in the many new business ideas and ventures that I suspect will come out of you. We celebrate your thoughtfulness, we celebrate your spirit, your spirit of camaraderie and compassion. A strong statement, if most of us were young again, we'd like to be like you. May I ask our guests to join me in celebrating our graduates today.
But amazing as you may be, you would not be here if it wasn't for the support and love of many other people. So beyond celebrating, today is a day of thanksgiving. It's a day that we give thanks because others have given so much to us. Often, I personally find it very calming before I go to sleep in the closing moments of the day to think about the people in the day or more broadly who have donated and given so much to my life. So let's do that exercise together. My first thanks goes to you. I'm grateful for your decision to come here. I'm grateful for your decision to be part of this community. I'm grateful for your decision to be all in, to be really engaged with what's going on. And I think you're gonna hear more of this from the student speakers. Part of this experience is the remarkable gift that you've given to one another. And I think you all know what that's all about. Uh, a gift that no thank you card will ever be enough of. I'm also grateful, as I hope you are as well, on days like today, for the amazing faculty and staff who work at Side Business School every day. Whether it's these amazing faculty members, some of whom are up here, or the staff who might serve you food in the morning, clean your blackboards, um, or make sure that uh, you know, everything is working, timetabling, or maybe they worked on admissions and recruiting and brought you to the school. It's an amazing group of people. Uh, I'd like to especially call out our, our MBA director, Ian Rogan, who worries about every aspect of your program. From start to finish, from the day you started to think about this program till forever as alumni, I hope that this, you're part of this community and that we should thank the people who've made that possible. So can I ask all of you to thank our staff for all the work that they've done. You may worry about the operational capability of the school because it looks like we counted wrong on the chairs. <laughs> but we didn't. I've asked for a chair to be there that's empty to reflect the fact that sadly over the summer, two of our important members of our community have passed away. Um, our colleague David Upton, whom some of you I think met, uh, passed away last month. He was a master teacher, an expert researcher in operations, cybersecurity, IT and more. David and I were colleagues since 1989. He came to Oxford about a year before I did. Uh, his loss is a major loss for the school. The other person who would be sitting up here with us might have been Dame Helen Alexander. Uh, Helen was a dear friend, the former head of The Economist, the head of the CBI, but she was the chair of our Business Advisory Council, which Sam Laidlaw, whom you're about to meet, uh, currently chairs a new variety of. Uh, uh, Helen was also, uh, you know, just an extraordinarily amazing woman. And for those of you who are women, she was a pioneer uh, and a fierce pioneer. So this, this day, I want to take a moment and just remember them, if we could just spend a moment in silence to remember not only them, but others who may not be with us today. Thank you. But our most sincere thanks have to go to the people who are not dressed up in these funny suits. Um, some of whom are here, probably many of whom aren't. It's to your parents, to your partners, to your children, to your friends, to your loved ones. And let's just think about that for a moment. So this will be the first time today, at least formally they'll be celebrated, hopefully not the last. Uh, do we even know all the things that they did so that we could get here? Right? There's a lot of things that we know that they did, but there's so much more that they didn't. The, the visible things are obvious, but far more numerous are the invisible things that they do to make sure that we are the people that we are. Uh, invisible actions of love and support. So if you think about it, they've spent many a night reading you goodnight stories. Um, in some cases, they read goodnight stories to your kids because you were busy. In some cases, they are your kids and they wish you were there. Um, you can hug them, uh, you can thank them properly, but as a group, let's start the ceremony the way that we should, which is thanking the, your loved ones. Can I ask the class to stand up and thank your families?
as it should be. So going back 355 days, I wouldn't center my speech on how wonderful you were, or how wonderful Oxford was, or how demanding the program would be. You don't need that anymore. You've been through it. Um, I hope you found it stimulating, thought-provoking, transformational. I hope you found some magical moments, whether by learning about different culture from one of your classmates or sharing a meal with a friend, gliding over the river, probably far too early in the morning, enjoying the Oxford Union, or maybe just walking through this amazing city where at sunset, Oxford stone, which is limestone, just turns a color that's almost like flesh. Um, what I did speak about a year ago was the work ahead. And I said that you'd have to learn some stuff. So first, you know, can learn new concepts around business, check. Uh, you'd have to become a deeper critical thinker, check. We talked about the boundaries that might be expanded through the program content, through your instructors, your classmates, your speakers, check. At least I hope they're all checked. But the hardest assignment that I gave you in that first day was to think in this year about you, about who you are, how you're gonna to contribute to the world. I suggested that you needed to sit quietly to discern a still and quiet voice. That voice might not be yours, but rather, as Elijah found in the Old Testament, divine inspiration. This isn't church, don't worry. Um, but Elijah had just had a dramatic moment. He was at the top of his game. Uh, and it was very clear to everybody that he was at the top of his name. Things were loud, extraordinarily loud. And the thing that got through to him was not something louder, but something really quiet. And it was the quiet voice, in fact, that frightened him and led him to action. And what I asked you a year ago to think about was that quiet voice that might be telling you what to do. So what is that little voice? I can't answer it for you, but I think that we have to ask that question for us collectively as Oxford. What is that quiet voice that we're hearing that motivates us, that defines our values? And this seems like as good a time as any to have that conversation. In terms of the noise, remember I said Elijah, it was a noisy time, you know, you know the prophets had just been killed and you know, he was like a big hero. Um, on the one side here, there's the magical noise of Oxford. And it is a noisy, magical place. Um, you know, it's the noises of uh, vehicles going by, far too many tourists, you know, the din of the school um, and all that. And the magical moments at the embats or the union or a pint or wherever, um, that's a noisy, heady experience. Yet globally, the noise in the last 12 months has been very different than in this Oxford bubble. We witnessed natural disasters, extreme weather events, recently in Mexico, in India, in Texas, man-made disasters, and the Caribbean, you know, and there's so many, uh, man-made disasters, terrorists across Europe, Rohingya in Myanmar, atrocities in Sudan, and elected disasters. <laughs> We've seen cherished values trampled on. We've seen long-term efforts to save our planet cast aside for alleged short-term gain. We've seen class and race and nationality rifts opened up as wide as they've been in years. We've seen truth deemed an option. So there's a lot of noise on both sides, this kind of fun little noise here at Oxford and, and this other noise that we can't ignore. So what quiet voice do we hear? What does it mean to be an Oxonian? Question I ask myself just about every day. What's, what is this place about? Sure, there's operational issues, but at the core, what defines us as Oxonians? Um, I may not get it right. This is the part where we'd have a discussion, but I think in the context, it's gonna be a little difficult. So I'm gonna suggest a few things for us to perhaps discuss later or think about, um, about the values that might reflect what it means to be an Oxonian, especially in this world that we live in today. So in a world where facts and evidence are optional, where falsehoods are simply relabeled as alternative facts, where the loudest voice is conceived to be the smartest voice, we have to do something else. In Oxford, we always seek to understand the truth and to speak the truth to power. We understand that the world's number one ranked university, and yes, you can cheer about that. <laughs> has a commitment to truth based on facts and objective evidence. 
This is why the majority of the faculty's time is devoted to research. We're constantly trying to incorporate the newest and deepest thinking into our classes and why we write, why we speak, and why we teach. In a world where thinking is sloppy or non-existent, we must challenge ourselves to think clearly and critically. Our commitment to creativity, curiosity, experimentation, excellence, rigor, critical thinking, all reflect our purpose. This is at the core of what it means to be at a university. And even though you'll be alumni, it's still at the core of what it means to be an Oxonian. Um, even when facts aren't clear, we use our reason and we use our clear thinking to try to make sense of the world. That's half of it. The other half of it has to start after thinking. Our work has to be more than thinking. Especially in a business school, we recognize that our decisions and our actions are not automatically dictated by logic and evidence. Rather, we can't do anything, we can't act without combining our logic and evidence with values. Centuries ago, when Oxford was explicitly a religious institution, the source of these values was made clear, at least for them. And if you look at the motto of Oxford, it says, Dominus Illuminatio Mea. Today, perhaps that doesn't sound right. We believe in different gods, and so simply appealing to that doesn't work. So we have to think about what the values are rather than simply agree on a motto. So I would propose for discussion two core values that define what it means to be an Oxonian, and they are respect and service. With respect to respect, in a world where ad hominem attacks are common, uh, and the people that we disagree with are marginalized, we have to rise above that. In a world that tries to pit one group against another, we have to respect and celebrate our differences while we see amazing commonalities. One of the books I read this summer was a book on genetics. Turns out that more than 95% of our DNA is common. Turns out that there are so many more similarities between us than there are differences. And then the move from genetics to metallurgy. If you think about it, pure metals are not terribly strong. It's in fact alloys, composites, that have imperfections in them that make the strongest metals. Like metals, we are stronger when we combine our differences. We are stronger because you are a diverse community where everybody's a minority, where no one is marginalized, I hope. Um, don't get me wrong, it's messy. It would be far simpler to divide us into groups. But one of the core concepts, the values that has to define us is respect, respect for one another, and respect for the differences. So I, I hope that you would agree that that's an important component of what it means to be an Oxonian. Another one that I think is equally important is an old-fashioned word called service. So what is service? So first of all, we don't serve by thinking. Even us, even the academics, we don't serve by thinking. You have to turn that thinking into writing and teaching and engagement. And so we, we serve by our teaching and our writing and our educating. You serve by leading because you want to become leaders of the world, business leaders. Serving yourself doesn't count. So it's important you serve yourself, make sure you're healthy, but that doesn't count. Serving the people who you owe obligations to, that doesn't count so much either. Of course, you're obligated to serve your family, your customers, your employees. But I think true service doesn't start until you're serving people that you will never see, either people who are far away or people who have not yet been born. We serve when we seek to make others better off without them ever knowing who we are. So then let's think about what that means for leadership. I've been thinking a lot about this over the, the, in the news in the last six months. So there's a saying, you know, many you know, CEOs have said this, you can't park your values at the door. Okay, I, makes sense. If you have strong values, you better bring them into work and act accordingly. But there's a converse that people don't talk about, which is if you're a leader, you don't park your leadership when you leave your firm or your organization either. Your values have to stay in on the way out, and your leadership has to stay in on the way in, and your leadership has to stay in place on the way out. What does that mean? We're increasingly seeing brave business leaders who are saying things publicly um, and taking risky stands, stands that may be costly to themselves and to their firms, stands that may cost them their jobs, staring down a potential political, well, staring down a, a, a powerful political leader stating that your values are in contrast to what it is that other people think can bring you enemies. It can cost you your job, but you need to be true to yourself. 
So if service is what we're all about, and if service is evidence through leadership, I think we have to embed all these values together. So you may be thinking, and your guests may be thinking, this is the normal high-minded graduation speech. And the answer is it's not. Because we are incredibly fortunate to be Oxonians. Oxford is not only that top-ranked university in the world, it's also one of the most powerful. I've been here for six years. There's virtually no one that I've tried to reach who wouldn't take my call because I said I was from Oxford. It may open doors, it's not necessarily gonna get everything done. Leaders from every sector have come from Oxford and people will listen to you more intently. Now, unfortunately, you're gonna be branded an elite um, and you deserve to be branded an elite, but that doesn't take away from the real and tangible benefits that flow from your association with this storied place. So where does that leave us 355 days from the Nelson Mandela Theater? Nearly a year ago, the people who gathered around us here were somewhere else. They were wishing you well, they were worried about you, they were waiting for your first Skype to know that you were, that, that you were okay. They were and will always be your biggest fans and backers. Cherish them. A year ago, the people around you were strangers. Um, now there's so much more. Cherish them. A year ago, the world in which we live seemed a bit more, less, less fragile. Our, view, our future and our values seem a bit more at risk. And whatever you do next, and I'm sure you'll do great work, please do whatever you can to uphold our values of respect and service. Best of luck and congratulations. I'm proud to be your dean. Thank you very much.
Hello, uh, for the benefit of our guests, my name is Ian Rogan and I'm the MBA program director. Uh, I would like to first congratulate the graduating class, so congratulations, and also welcome all of the family and friends joining us here today. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Sam Laidlaw. He is the executive chairman of Neptune Oil and Gas Limited and former CEO of Centrica. Most importantly for us, he is the first chairman of the newly formed Oxford Said Global Leadership Council. The inaugural group consists of a global network of 28 current and former chairs, CEOs, and C-level executives from leading organizations in both the public and private sector. These include Acumen, Apple, Blacklock, Rock, L'Oreal, McKinsey, UBS, and others. The Council helps advance the school's unique business education model as an integral part of the wider University of Oxford. The Council advises on strategy and initiatives that promote the school's global profile, including its relations with the corporate sector, program development and research. We are honored to have Sam Laidlaw as chairman of the Council, and we are especially honored to have him as today's guest speaker. Please join me in welcoming Sam Laidlaw. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ian. And let me, first of all, start by echoing my congratulations after 355 days of what I'm sure has been hard work, some challenging assignments, but also, I think, the opportunity to make some great friendships. You're all to be congratulated on you know, achieving not, not just graduating through an MBA program, but, a, but graduating through one of what's undoubtedly the best MBA programs in the world. And I'm thrilled to be associated with, with the Said Business School. It's a relatively recent involvement for me, but I've watched the progress of the Business School over the years, moving up the international ranking orders, and that's, I think, been the result not only of some fabulous teaching, but some great research, but above all, actually, the, the results of you as students and the contributions that you have made in, in not only your time here, but also the things that your predecessors have gone to do uh, afterwards. So many congratulations to all of you. Now, the dean asked me to say a, a, f a few words, and I'll be brief, about my own career and perhaps share some of the learnings along the way that may have some relevance to, to all of you. And I was very intimidated by this, and I thought I was going to have to be doing this in Latin. but. Fortunately, fortunately for you and for me, I'm, I'm told I can, I can speak in English. Um, but I think my career, really, in, in short, has been largely and almost entirely in the energy business. And you may say, well, how did you, how did you pick the energy business? And the, the short answer, I suppose, is that my father, who was in the oil business, said, whatever you do, don't go into the energy business. <laughs> Um, and I followed his advice, as, as a dutiful son would do, and I went to Cambridge, read economics and law, and became a lawyer, because the, the convention then was if you want to get a good job, you had to, become a, a, you had to acquire a profession. And I realized during my time, and I, I qualified as a lawyer, that actually I wasn't satisfied, if you like, watching the game being played, providing advice to others. I wanted to get on the pitch and actually play the game myself. Or as sort of Teddy Roosevelt, I think, famously put it, you know, the credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, who strives valiantly, who knows the great enthusiasms, and spends himself on a worthy cause. And I think it's finding that thing that you have a passion about and following your dream that to me is, is the, the the critical success factor of all, of all great careers. And so I took myself off to a, a business school, uh, which we won't mention in this great uh, organization, but uh, it's in France. And it, at that stage, actually, it was, <laughs> it was um, a little bit smaller than probably an MBA intake than, uh, than the Said School is today, but made some great friendships along the way, which have stood me uh, that in throughout sort of difficult times and also through periods of, of sort of great celebration. Um, and after that, I, I did decide that I wanted to go into the energy industry, and I was drawn by the fact that it has a unique 
combination of combining technology with economics, with politics, it's global, but above all, it actually is essential to human progress and economic development, and, and no society can, can develop and, and thrive without you know, good sources of energy, and now, of course, clean sources of energy, which is, which is vital for the future. And so I was, I was drawn by the relevance, but I wanted to go and work in an, in an entrepreneurial environment. So I went, to, I went to the States. Today, you know, in the, in the 1980s, the States was the land of opportunities and dreams, and still to a large extent is, although you might today go to Asia and, in, and China and India in, instead. But I found enormous appeal to working for an entrepreneurial company, and I was sent to work on drilling rigs in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama and Texas, and, and spent a lot of time sort of working on rigs, learning the ropes, essentially, um, and then went to, back to the headquarters in New York, and then, as a 27-year-old, was sent to the, back to the UK because we acquired some licenses to go and look for oil and gas in the North Sea. And... Um, Bob Anderson, who started Arco, sort of famously said that, you know, if you can't stand disappointment 90% of the time, you shouldn't be in the exploration business. And that was very true. And we drilled wells and not much happened and the money was about to run out. And then we had some success and uh, we started to build a company. And in the mid 80s, I remember it well, in the middle of 1985, we made our first significant acquisition, which at the time was a $150 million acquisition. Uh, and the oil price was $25 a barrel, and we were feeling pretty good about life. Two days later, OPEC had a meeting, and the oil price went to $9 a barrel just after we'd closed our deal. So it looked massively underwater. And I guess the sort of second big learning for me was all around resilience. And necessity became the mother of invention. We actually worked to completely redesign the development concepts of these offshore fields and were the first people to use a floating production system to actually ex export oil and gas, for which we later were awarded the Queen's Award for Technology. And the, it turned out, actually, what had been a catastrophic economic failure became a huge economic success. So I suppose, you know, a big piece of that to me is always be curious always don't, never be afraid to challenge orthodoxies. And I think you know, you're at the stage in your life where you're, you're most creative. And actually that's something, don't, don't be hidebound by convention, keep testing the conventional orthodoxies, because I think that's, that's also an essential learning for me. So then the business sort of thrived. We had lots of good exploration successes and I was uh, and built the business in Norway and, uh, and uh, Denmark and other parts of the world. And then I was asked to go back to, to the US as uh, Chief Operating Officer for Amrata Hess, um, which I did for, for seven years and grew the business in Latin America and Asia and Africa. And we had a wonderful time. I was very lucky that I had a great mentor, Leon Hess, who had started the business, and he was a great entrepreneurial titan who had, it was a true American success story, and he built this incredible company to a Fortune 100 company, literally starting as a, as a truck driver in the Depression. And he was very sort of inspirational to me, and he kept on working. I was COO, he was chairman CEO, till he was 84. And then when he died, um, and he, handed over the shareholding to his son. His son was the same age as me, and his name was on the tank, mine wasn't. Um, so so um, I said, look, you know, we're both gonna be trying to do the same job. I came back to the UK, and actually, it was very shortly after that that tragically 9-11 happened, and the world was a very troubled place. Um, and I was sort of sitting at home wondering what to do next, and the phone rang, and I was asked to go and run uh, Enterprise Oil. And Enterprise Oil was, and I knew, again, the chairman very well. He'd been a fierce competitor of mine, and I thought, how's this gonna work? Um, but actually, I think um, Cheryl Sandberg put it well in uh, her sort of recent remarks. Actually, a, a career is a jungle gym. It's not a ladder. And you just got to, if you see an opportunity, and, and you see a rocket ship, take a seat, 
don't, don't worry about what seat it is, climb aboard, because I think you know, you've, you've got to sort of seize the opportunities. And that would be another, another learning for me. I didn't take a long time to think about it. The business had got some significant challenges, but we turned it around, and it was actually starting to make good progress. And, and uh, during that process, I, I managed to also build a great team. And the teamwork, I think, is, is something that obviously you, you read about a lot, you learn as you go along. Um, to me, always having people on the team who are smarter than you, and that's not difficult for me, maybe more difficult for you. For you. Uh, always having people who, who actually are prepared to speak up and having real diversity on the team. Obviously, and most importantly, gender diversity, but also ethnicity, also just diversity of education if you're in a oil and gas business, if you put very optimistic geologists together with very prudent engineers, you get a chemistry and, and you get solutions that none of them individually would have, would have thought of. So, so diversity, hugely important and an exciting to be part of a winning team. You know, that's something where, where people collectively think of something that none of them would have individually thought of. That's really powerful, but also in times of adversity. A, a, a winning team and a close team can be an enormous source of support. To do that, I think you've obviously got to empower others, and I think you know, the mark of great leaders uh, is a people who actually not only make others better as a result of their presence, but actually make sure that the impact lasts beyond their presence. And you know, that's something that I've always learnt from some of the mentors that I've had along the way and stri stri striven to do. So, in terms of uh, enterprise, a, a great, great fun, but then what, what happened was that the Italian state, state oil company came along and wanted to buy the business. Uh, we told them the price wasn't high enough, we, they, we, they went away. Um, but then Shell came along and said they wanted to pay a 60% premium, so the shareholders thought that was irresistible. And to me, that was the end of a, of a dream, and, and, and very sad for the team, because although Shell is a wonderful company, when you build something up that you have a lot of personal investment in, and you've got a great group of people, you then have to hand, it, hand over your baby to, to a much bigger organization. And, and I then thought about, what do I do next? And I think it comes back a little bit to I was working with private equity and I was enjoying that, but it comes back to some of the remarks that the Dean was making in terms of wanting to paint a, on an important picture, on a, on a bigger canvas, actually doing something that was going to be really worthwhile. And I was approached by the chairman of Chevron to join the board because they had put Chevron and Texaco together, but actually wanted to grow the business in Russia and the Middle East, and this was just after the, the first, um, just after the Iraq war, and there were high hopes that the Middle East would be an opportunity, not just for oil companies to invest in, but actually to build economic bridges between Middle East and, and Western companies, and likewise in Russia, and this was just post the Yeltsin era, era when Putin was just starting, um, to see whether actually we could really build stronger economic connections that would help liberalize the, the, the Russian economy. Well, unfortunately, as you, as you all know, you know, the politics in Russia didn't permit that. The Kremlin took back the control of the commanding heights of the economy. And in the Middle East, you know, the, the, the war and the aftermath of the war was much more complex than people thought. So I, and I had had three years of living on an airplane um, in Moscow, Baghdad, and San Francisco. My family had four teenage children, and I thought it would be a good thing to live in the same time zone as my family for a while. Um, and I think that's a very important part of what the Dean was talking about too, in that you actually have to listen to your loved ones, listen, listen to your friendships. You've got to nourish your friendships, your family, because they are an enormous source of, of counsel, of support, of advice, um, it, both in good times and in bad times. And, and, and they've certainly been you know, absolutely at, at the root and, and support of everything that I've managed to achieve. And I think, you know, actually, um, Obama had some remarks about leadership, which were quite in interesting. And, and 
you know, one of the things he said in terms of being sort of true to yourself and what you do is ask yourself every day whether, what you, whether you were doing what you set out to do. And that's a tough test. Um, and there will, be, there will be days, you know, when, which inevitably where, where you deviate from that. But I think if you keep asking yourself that question, uh, then you keep your true north as, as, as to something that really fulfills your dream and, and is true to yourself. So I came back to the UK and was lucky enough to, to be a, appointed, and some would say that it was a, it was a, a difficult assignment um, to be CEO of Centrica. And, and Centrica is the UK's sort of largest energy supplier. Uh, it was a business, it is best known for the, for the fact that it owns British gas. So it also has businesses in North America and other countries. But, British Gas was the sort of political lightning rod. It's probably the, the business where the tension between shareholders' expectations and actually the customers' and politicians' expectations plays out most publicly because nobody likes paying for their gas and electricity bills. And this was at a time when oil, oil, international oil prices were going up very rapidly. But I was drawn to it by a sense of this is actually a really important thing to try and get right. The business was struggling, uh, the customer service was poor, the business model didn't work because we didn't have any sources of our own power generation, and we had to solve this, what we call the trilemma, this equation of, of providing affordable, uh, secure supplies of energy, clean energy, and decarbonizing at an affordable price for consumers, a, a very difficult equation to solve. And if we could get that right, it could make a huge impact on Britain's competitiveness, but also on you know, people's standard of living and people's affordability in, in the home. And I did that for nine years. I think with, with some success, it, it's, it's still a struggle as a business, but I, certainly it was transformed in terms of having its own sources of gas and power. It became a much more diversified business, and, and it provided you know, reasonable returns to shareholders. But actually, one of the things that I found most rewarding about it was actually the programs that we did have for the fuel poor, for the disadvantaged, for people who couldn't help themselves. And this sense of service that the dean was talking about, I think, is, was, was actually one of the most rewarding elements. And towards the end of my time there, we, we launched a social entrepreneurship program called Ignite, which actually funds and invests in social entrepreneurship startups particularly focused in the energy sector, and that was just a wonderfully exciting thing to, to be involved in. So I've now gone back to private equity, to Neptune oil and gas that are out of the limelight, but I'm still following my dream of exploration. You know, the exploration business is a treasure hunt. It's one of those sort of exciting things that, that, I, that I enjoy, but also trying to make a difference uh, more, more globally in the low carbon agenda, which, I, which I'm very committed to. So, those are just sort of some of the thoughts that I wanted to, to leave with you and share with you during my career. Some of them may, may resonate, and I think a lot of them echo what the Dean was talking about earlier. But I, you know, I hope that all of you really find the sort of meaning and purpose and vision to your life that, uh, that actually helps you navigate the difficult periods. Uh, and also, I think, I hope you all have the ambition to change the world because the world certainly needs it and I think there's no doubt that you've all got the talent to do so. So, you know, thank you all for, for sparing the time to listen to me, but the great congratulations again to all of you for, for a terrific achievement and I hope it's the beginning of wonderful careers for all of you.
And now, with a view from the class, I'd like to welcome Sagar Doshi and Christina Partsinovelos. come forward and join me. I'm going to speak first and then Sagar is going to go right after me, so just have a seat. <laughs> what are you doing, Christina? Why are you even doing an MBA? Have you heard of LinkedIn? Perhaps you just need to schmooze a little bit better. Don't, don't you want to start a family? You know those eggs, they won't last forever. <laughs> Dean Tefano, esteemed professors, Saeed's staff that's sitting in the back over there, family and friends, and most importantly, the class of 2016-2017. Thank you for welcoming me to the stage to explain why all of those naysayers were completely wrong. Coworkers and friends alike both questioned my reasoning for dropping everything to move to a city I had never even seen before. For what? For three letters after my name? They felt it wasn't worth the investment, that I should be saving my money for my first property or maybe settling down with Mr. Wright. Boy, were they wrong. <laughs> Any expectations I had before coming to Oxford were completely surpassed the first day of class when I met my classmates. It is each and every single one of you that have truly made this experience. The school loves to quote how multicultural we are. 327 students from what, 57, 58 countries, it varies every day. But the stats can't even begin to do the diversity of this class justice. You've got Kin, she's sitting somewhere here, who's born in Malaysia to Chinese parents, but lived in Uganda and identifies as Canadian. <laughs> You can raise your hand, Ken. I don't know where you are right now, but you can... Ah, there she is. Or Adam from the U.S., who lived in Taiwan, is fluent in Mandarin, and is now moving to the Philippines. And it's not too often that the popular Scottish celebration, Burns Night, is organized by a Slovakian and an Indian. <laughs> you, yeah, you guys know where you are. But that's our class. We are a class not identified by where we came from, but by our shared passion, our accomplishments, and perhaps most importantly, our visions for the future. I'm sure you all know this because your children are here and we're all special individuals, but we aren't your typical MBA class either. Yes, we want to be successful. Yes, we want to make money. Yes, we will work in the best interest of shareholders, and certainly, we aren't shy, and we know this, we aren't shy to voice our opinions to a crowd. But this class actually cares about the way in which success is achieved. It is these classmates who organized trips to Slovakia uh, or to Lebanon and made sure to include everyone. It is these classmates who set up groups to work on assignments and revise for exams. You've got Ben Young, who ran an analytics review class on the weekend, which was completely packed, even though he has a, a wife here and two children, and he too has to study for the exam, but he worked with us and helped us, and that's just one example. It is these classmates who also organized amazing events, such as the Africa Business Conference or Diwali, to just name a few. We understand that in order to succeed and prosper, we need to help each other out. A characteristic that sets us apart from other MBA classes. I'm sorry, I know you didn't go here, and there's a reason for that. No. <laughs> I didn't just say that. But in general, I attended a conference in Berlin where I met many other MBA students, and several highlighted just how competitive and cutthroat their classmates were, rarely working together on assignments. To me, this is what distinguishes our class and other MBAs. It's that sense of community, cohesion. My classmate and friend Atherton, who's from Zimbabwe in the second row over there, used an analogy when we were teaching business students in Uganda just last week. He grabbed a chair and said, 
See this chair? Pretend this is a chair. See this chair? We need to shake it now in this safe environment to make sure it's sturdy and that the pieces won't fall apart before we sell it off into the world. He was telling the students that it's okay to make mistakes and be vulnerable in the safety of this community. That's how we learn. That's how we prepare ourselves for the challenges ahead. This sense of community extends beyond the classroom, whether it be rugby matches, college rowing, comedy acts, or even watching Constance's performance in a Greek play when most of us, including myself, don't even speak the language. We supported each other. During the MBAT sports competition in Paris, where we competed against other European schools, this culture of cohesion couldn't have been more evident. It was this class, this class, that excelled in their sports and left other schools floundering, with the exception of Ollie's swimming attempts. <laughs> I know that all these parents, their mom is there. Uh, the way we first, we, the way we won first place overall was so characteristic of Saeed. We didn't need tryouts or endless practice sessions to make our sports teams. We were already a team. Probably the biggest challenge was not getting Vladimired by our fellow South African classmate Vlad. He can drink like a fish. That's what the, that, that was Romans. <laughs> And on top of this, on top of this, we are responsible for Saeed's first mascot, the lion. A fine animal for a mascot, you would think, symbolizing strength and courage. But the truth is, it was the only costume Amazon Prime would deliver to Ben Redden <laughs> in 24 hours. And I, I gotta say thank you to Amazon because I think, what, uh, dozens of people in our class have been hired by them? M not me, but a lot of other people here. <laughs> and now at the end of this 12 months, you may be reflecting on your time here, what you did, what you didn't do, and perhaps you were worrying about what lies ahead. A lot of us still don't even have jobs yet. But what you have done so far has worked. The gambles you made, the paths you've chosen, they worked because they brought you here. There are any number of business schools you could have chosen, but you chose Oxford. You chose Said. Whatever the reason was, it brought us all to the same place to experience something together. And now, for the hard part. Leaving this bubble that we all love to complain about. Returning to normal life. Trying to match what we experienced here the intellect that we experienced here, at that perfect job in that ideal city, at that amazing salary. As you take this next big step, we have to remember not to be scared to take risks, fail, and move on. For if you risk nothing, you risk everything. And don't fear asking others for help. Remember, you now have 326 new friends who will be there to help you along the way. This is Oxford and you are Oxford MBAs. Go with your heads held high. Thank you. God's help you all. You've chosen two North Americans to speak today, mistake number one. <laughs> to those of you I don't know, families, friends, my name is candidate number 1010355. I'm very happy to meet you all. <laughs> so in the few minutes I have, I want to reveal a secret to you. But first, you have to deal with some obligatory Sagar stuff, because I'm not going to pass up this opportunity. <laughs> Look at this building, the Sheldonian. The dean's already talked about it. This building is far older than most of our national constitutions. Take a look at the sky. See that false sky up there? There's a baby in the center. Does everyone see the baby? It's been crying out over the course of the evening. <laughs> that baby is truth. 
Look closely. In the middle, as descending from above, truth in a cloud sits, harmless as a dove. One hand a palm branch holds for victory, in the other is the sun in his radiancy. Intense, right? Truth, victory, radiance. Oxford has subtext everywhere. And if you can read it, it's speaking to you. Sometimes it's speaking subtly, and sometimes forcefully, but, but it's always there. I've been reflecting on the power of this place recently because I've been trying to make sense of what we've had this year and this astonishing, joyful, marvelous year we've had. I don't know about you, but, but the community that we have started, that we have crafted here, stands unique in my life. It is somehow more profound, more personal, more laden with sparkle and spice than any other I've had. And why is that? Surely, surely the fact that we come from different backgrounds, from different places, that's made a difference. But I don't know. I, I, I doubt that we would have built the community that we have had we been in some other anonymous city or in some other year. So why then? So to figure this out, I did what any good MBA would do. I pulled out my new toolbox of tricks. I started with a five forces analysis. <laughs> that didn't do much good. A claim demarcating control exercise was a bit more helpful. Uh, but I gotta say, I should have just put things into an Excel spreadsheet and asked Solver to do it for me. <laughs> because that spit out the answer. And the answer, the answer came in the form of a message. A message that Oxford sent to us back, back ye a year ago, back when our emotions were mostly awe, humility, and especially intimidation. I wasn't ready to hear it then, and perhaps you weren't either, but I think we might be ready to hear that message now. You, young student, said Oxford to us, you have come here to me. You are here because you want something. I know, I see it in your eyes. You want friendship, understanding truth, credibility, progress. There is something. But I see through you. You are yet unsure. You, you feel the actor playing a part. Yes, you do all the right things. You dash about from one of my libraries to the next. You pretend to know which fork goes with which salad. <laughs> you play dress up with Subfusk. And you try to tell all the other boats on the river that yes, you know how to punt. <laughs> but you are fake. You are an imposter and worst of all, you have the audacity, the arrogance, the temerity to think that in this you are alone. But you are not. Because to your woes, I offer you this remedy. 327 other people, just like you. At first, they will seem amazingly different. They will speak in endlessly melodious accents. Some will have families. Some will be fresh from university. They will pursue varying vocations, diverse passions. Some will have the audacity to find puns funny. <laughs> but I'll give you this. Every one of them will have wicked sharp style. But mistake them not. They are all to a soul parallel to you. Every one of them starts out uncomfortable, ill at ease, unsure. And that is the point. No new Oxonian can enter this place immediately at ease. My world is odd, unusual, even anachronistic, on purpose. Sometimes that feels magical, perhaps more often infuriating. But one thing is sure. You will all drift separately in this ocean of discomfort until you find each other in the murk. You learn the currents and you swim as a school. Together you will panic about my exams. Together you'll find shortcuts along my canals. Together you will break bread in my colleges. You will compete abroad and return victorious together. You will learn from each other different values. You will question your own. And you will spend time understanding the dazzlingly diverse ways of living a good life. You see, my gift to you is not Oxford. It is fraternity amid uncertainty. And by the end, 
like so many who have come before you, you will belong. Okay, enough of the ghostly voice of Oxford, right? <laughs> so here we are, one year on, and I think we've done it. I think we have gone through this journey that Oxford has set us on, and I think we've done it well. You see, whatever your individual experience has been, you came paddling in a kayak and you leave a member of a crew. Look, we're experienced enough, we understand that, that this crew won't last forever. It's transient. We are here today, yes, to mark the achievement of our common goals, but, but also to mark our imminent separation. Even as we do so, though, we are going to be part of and form new communities. And as we do that, I hope that we gestate and nurture communities of our own, because that is the lesson I take from this year. And look, if we ever forget, Oxford isn't going anywhere. We can return to this spot, look up to this painted sky, and remember that which matters. Seeking truth, achieving victory, and revealing radiance. Thank you. I would now like to present the MBA 2016-17 students. Please refrain from applauding until the final student has been presented. Okay. Tasneem Abdul Hadi. Ahmed Abu Bakr, Isam Abu Aisha, Nitisha Agawal, Mankaran Aluwalia, Siddhar Ajit, Dima Altaba, Kate Lado Alpa. Ran Ann, Anthony Nidhi, Harriet Austin, 
Samantha Aviles, Kanza Azimi, Leo Baltak, Vinayak Banerjee, Avery Bang, Mahira Basri, Stefan Becker, Jillian Benjamin, Rahul Batewara, Furnam Bitgoli, Mofe Benite, Alexi Blindel, George Bloomfield, Hugo Babadija, Adadeo Balagi Adio, Eric Bolthan, Amon Boshoff, Christopher Brady, Paul Brister, Jared Bojan, Elisa Buakiu, Joseph Byrne, Wenji Kao, Tony Chan, Aditi Chatterjee, Miraj Chaya, <coughs> Lauren Chidoni, Rutendo Chigora, Peter Alexandri Chua, Wang Yin Chua, Christine Sonia Klassen, Charles Kohik, Jennifer Collins, Seth Collins, Amir Habib Khmer, David Crawley, Jacob Kushni, Harish Dadu Gonzalez, Michael James Dagley, Akshay Dalal, Kevin Davis, Allegra Day, Mayank Dayal, Louis Decock, Arjun Dahl, Bikram Dingra, Bharat Dodi, Afwa Dogbatsi, Saga Doshi, Mayank Shekhar Divedi, <laughs> <laughs> Davidson Anthony Edwards, Nathan Evans, Anna Ermakova, <laughs> Alexandros Evripides, Kyle Ewan, Julie Fabrizio, Dana Feldman. Juan Pedro Fernandez Cueto, and Kuna Fonso Amidu, Arturo Fontaine, Kenneth Fu, Christopher Forsyth, Edward Fricker. Robin Fukumoto, Diana Garibaldi, Anatoly Gasparian, Alison Gates, Dmitry Gavrilov, Gautam Gopade, Aidan Gill, Jessica Glenny, Oscar Gonzalez Argambao, Tara Gooding, Raj Gopalakrishnan, 
Himadri Gorai. Scott Gorman. Sanjana Govil. Tuki Graham. Devin Grant. Katerina Gromotka. Neha Gupta. Niyati Gupta. Raghav Gupta. Anthony Hapshmin. Brian Hall. Annie Hayakuni. Alex Helpenstow. Macarena Hernandez Diobeso. Ewan Hollingsworth. Cheng Yu Sayo. Carol Hughes Hollett. Tristan Humphreys. Ifa Rongmin Huo. Aviv Itkin. Ravi Janapuredi. Ankit Javeri. Chin Yao Jan. Laura Johnson Blair. Oliver Jones. John Kakungulu Walogembe. Ilias Kamun. Sabasachi Carr. Geddes Karaja. Melis Karaja. Tanvi Karambelkar. Giant Kashyap. Laksika Kate Barone. Darius Keller. Tobias Kynat. Robin King. Anastasia Kizima. Joseph Knight. Marina Korskowa. Constance Kratzer. Andrei Kravchenko. Anshul Krishna. Veena Krishnamurthy. Rohit Kumar. Christopher Larson. Mindy Loriano. Stephen Lawn. Martin Lee. Seong Hoon Lee. Luo Lee. Sarun Larkpanyaroj. Athena Liu. Peter Lynx. Deping Leo. Yu Young Leo. Benjamin Lloyd. Boitumelo Luarte. Dmitry Lebanov. Andrew Lopes. Vladimir Lovrich. Xi Lu. Cindy Yu Hao Lu. Tunan Ma. Charles Madden. Ankit Mahajan. Orkan Mahamadi. Anthony Mahira. Shamil Mendirata. Hasimran Malhi. 
Stephanie Mambo. Dino Marcantonis. Taylor Markham. Gege Marcus. Christopher Matthew. Seisha McKinney. Julie McKinney. Thomas Minke. Maren Mend. Pranay Puneshwar Masram. Christy Murphy Mitchell. Sophie Mittelman. Shayanta Mandal. Megan Moore. Candice Modric. Suchi Subra Mukherjee. Karen Mumba. Atherton Tiri Mutambuera. Jerisha Nadaraju. Nikita Nadkani. Shailendra Singh Nama. Bobo Nazarov. Andrew Ern. Iris Yu Ni. Anna Nielsen. Anna Maria Nungo. Brian O'Brien. Max Ogles. Abel Okello. Pablo Oliveira. John O'Mara. Iwi Osimensa. Alex Owen Shubno. Arseni Palagin. Rarish Pamphil. Penny Pan. Nandia Pan Nanda Pandini Pandya. Anupama Panika. Mayank Pan. Prasad Parameswaran. Christina Parsinevelos. Parth Patel. Jackie Pelayas. Sonia Petkovic. Alexis Corbin. Daniela Postorini Medina. Tanvi Pradeep. Rahul Prasad. Tanmay Puri. Tilkesh Purohit. Danilo Pushedu. Alexi Rajabi. Siddharth Raguwanshi. Nina Ravi. Devin Elis Rebello. Benjamin Redden. Arjun Reddy. <coughs> Ahmad Rifat. Afar Rehman. 
and Emike Raingold. Eric Riffcoll. Richard Rogers. Pratik Ruhail. Yurai Sabal. Akil Sachdev. Yusuke Sakuyama. Ridwan Salim Sanad. Naman Sangvi. Ohi Santin. Jaman Saka. Bandini Set. Lucine Shamuradian. Alex Chaplin House. Shatak Sharma. Chris Sharwood. Atsushi Shimada. Olivia Sigula. Jai Karan Singh. Prajna Singh. Raj Karan Singh. Ruampon Siratana Panta. Kara Skikni. Dustin Skinner. Ojas B. Sony Das. Nabila Subeda. Aditya Srikumar. Ashish Srivastava. Daniel Stokely. Miguel Alexander Strobel. Jin Tan. Arman Chengu. Michael Tefula. John Ku Teo. George Frederick Tolheim. Ashley Thomas. Nicholas Thomas. Laura Thompson Love. Sreyas Tirunagari. Philip Turnka. Alison Trowbridge. Sasha Truong. Gina Tortoy. Takashi Ueda. Amrani Upadai. Erika Uen Ramirez. Suravi Vadia. Adrian Benoit Alexander Vadeboncourt. Sharanya Venkatesh. Shashank Varma. Charufan Vibunchan. Nai Si Wong. Runfei Philly Wong. 
Rebecca Wardle, Sammy Watu, Max Whitaker, Dijong Xiao. Zihan Shu Andrian Yagi Norman Yanua Kin Yi Siong Sein Yu Chen Ben Yang Anna Zelenkova, Yiming Zeng, Arthur Jong, Mike Jong, Xian Jong. Chi Jong Feng Lin Zhao Yun Si Zhen Beijing Ju Eden Zhou Adam Zwain Matthias Wanska, David Lansdale Sanders. Congratulations to the MBA class of Each year, we ask the class to nominate students who have made an outstanding contribution to the life and community of the MBA program. The whole community of MBA students, staff and faculty members, then vote and we award a small number of dean's commendations to these exceptional students. I would like to ask the following students to come up one by one and collect their dean's commendation. Um, they are. Lauren Chidoni. <laughs> Pranay Puneshwar Meshram. Shailendra Singh Nama. Pratik Ruhail. and Sasha Truong. <laughs> 
We would also like to take this time to formally recognize those students who have achieved the Dean's List on all three possible occasions. This is an extremely impressive feat on what is a challenging and diverse program. I would like to ask the following students to come up one by one and collect their Dean's List prize. They are Jennifer Collins, Kyle Ewan. <laughs> si Ong Hoon Lee. Andrew Ng. <laughs> Yorai Sebu. Philip Trunka. <laughs> Takeshi Ueda. and Norman Yanuar. Next, we have the J.P. Morgan MBA Prize, which is awarded for outstanding academic achievement in the Finance Corps courses and consists of a certificate and a check for 3,000 pounds. It is the Finance Prize, you know, so, but the, um, We have three recipients of the prize this year, each achieving the highest scores in accounting, analytics, or business finance. The J.P. Morgan Prize is awarded to Kyle Ewan. <laughs> Jenk Gunner, who is unable to be with us today, but still, let's give him applause. and Andrew Lopes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> There is one more prize, the Said Prize, awarded in recognition of outstanding academic achievement and contribution to the MBA class and wider school community. Thanks to the generosity of Mr. Said, this prize consists of a certificate and a check for 10,000 pounds.
this year's winner achieved a place on the Dean's List for recognition of outstanding achievement on two occasions, not an easy feat for such a challenging program. Although perhaps this shouldn't be surprising as they received a first class degree in economics during their time as an undergraduate. Here at Oxford, they are a member of St. Hugh's College, which means upon graduation, they will be in the enviable company of college alums, such as suffragette Emily Wilding, Wilding Dickinson, and author Mary Renault. Standing as one of the women's leadership OBN co-chairs, she worked hard to get exciting and engaging guest speakers in, helping to run one of the year's most active OBNs. This included the organization of In the Spotlight, an event highlighting the stories of just some of the fantastic women on the MBA program to help mark International Women's Day. Not only did, she, didn't, did this recipient help to organize this event, but she also shared her own story with it. I am thrilled to announce that the winner of the 2016-17 side prize is Kanza Azimi. Before bringing today's ceremony to a close, I would like to share a couple parting thoughts, a quote, but first some thank yous. Um, the MBA program is a school-wide undertaking, and so although we do have specific parts of the staff that do work on the MBA and are dedicated to it, um, I just want to thank all of the colleagues here today to help with the ceremony, the volunteers, not only today but throughout the year, so thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank... I would specifically like to thank our guest speaker, uh, Sam Laidlaw, thank you for being here. I would like to thank the leadership of the school, so Dean Tefano, thank you for your, your guidance. Thank you, uh, Deputy Dean Jonathan Reynolds, thank you as well. Associate Dean Kathy Harvey, they all helped this MBA program happen. I'm one of the people that focuses on it exclusively, but without all of them, it wouldn't be possible. That continues to our faculty colleagues here today. Um, thank you, academic, uh, MBA academic chair Richard Barker, Mark Ventresca, Michael Smets. Um, is, as well as um, Siddharth. Thank you very much for being here. Specifically, I'd like to thank uh, Dina Domit and her team. So Dina Domit is in charge of all student programs and services for the school. Within that is the MBA program, program team that is essential for me. And so on that team, I just want to thank Farzana, Zoe, Rachel, Harriet, David, Holly, and Christian. Thank you very much, guys.
And now, now just some imparting thoughts before we, before we break today. Um, so Oxford Said is a, is a young business school, albeit we're in a very ancient and esteemed university. And as a young business school, we are still establishing our place in the world. And we're doing so at a time where I think there's never been a more important moment for the private sector, either working for or with the private sector, to step up and take on these big challenges we face today. And although what happens during your year here in Oxford as MBA students is important, and our school's mission matters, ultimately, it is through the actions of our MBA alumni, you, through which the side business school will be defined. And so, you know, no pressure. You guys, it's up to you to really establish us. So thank you. With that in mind, I'd like to close with a quote. Um, and for, it's from Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever. It's one of my favorite CEO of the moment. And for our guests who maybe haven't gone to business school, the quote references Michael Porter. Michael Porter is a renowned strategy professor from Harvard Business School. And he has developed a framework called Creating Shared Value. And now for the quote. Michael Porter's shared value theory proposes aligning a company's core business with meaningful contributions to society. My philosophy goes a step further. It's not enough to say you contribute to a better world. The world is at a point where you have to solve the issues and reverse what is happening. Being good is no longer good enough. Companies must be part of the solution. Instead of finding ways to use society and the environment to be successful, companies must contribute to society and the environment or in order to sustain success. Success. So once again, that's Paul Pullman, Unilever. So in closing, go out into the world and do well, but while doing well, be part of the solution. Compete, but while competing, keep in mind not only your individual interests, but also the interests of the broader society within which you compete. And finally, have the courage to take the long-term view. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you. MBA students, esteemed guests, please rise for the procession.